Hello, welcome to our School Building Science Fridays, as we discuss ventilation and what you need to know. My name is Arnel Catalan, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the niche of the CHIPS National Technical Committee. As an architect, we specify low emitting materials, and our engineers design ventilation systems with a goal of providing a healthy learning environment for all occupants. We ensure that good indoor air quality practices are maintained during construction, such as covering ducts to prevent dust accumulation, protecting building materials stored on site to prevent growth of mold, and flushing out backwork systems before turning over the school building to the owner. We train facility managers on how to operate and maintain HVAC systems efficiently and provide a user's guide to occupants so they can have a good understanding of controls and operable windows. We hope that our speakers today will expand your understanding of the ventilation systems behind a green and healthy school, and that you will join us for more School Building Science Fridays. We thank our sponsors for making this series possible. I2 Architecture, Group 14 Engineering, Hurricane Season, and Healthy Schools Network. A few housekeeping points. Post your questions at any time in the chat box. Please remain muted and look for the slides and recording on the CHIPS website next week. And now I would like to introduce Todd Demont from the Indoor Air Hygiene Institute. Todd is Chief Innovation Officer of Medicine Indoor Air Quality and Chief Technology Officer of the Indoor Air Hygiene Institute under the Medicine umbrella. In his roles, Todd identifies and leads the development of innovative new product concepts, markets, and solutions across all of medicine's companies. They launched the Indoor Air Hygiene Institute in 2020 to provide IQ certification to commercial buildings, including schools. Please welcome Todd Demont. Thank you, Arnell. Uh, let me start off today's meeting with introducing our three experts. First is Tracy Washington Enger. She's worked for the US EPA in the Office of Air since 1994. In her current position in the Indoor Environments Division, she develops, promotes, and implements education outreach programs that protect public health from indoor environmental pollutants. She has worked for 20 years on building capacity for school districts across the country to create greener, cleaner, and healthier learning environments by implementing the EPA Indoor Air Quality Tools for Schools Action Kit. Also with us today is Christian Weeks. Christian is the CEO of Enverid Systems, a leader in indoor air quality and energy efficiency. Christian has over a decade of experience in energy efficiency and indoor air quality and is passionate about helping buildings achieve their energy efficiency and indoor air quality goals through smart investments in HVAC systems and proven air cleaning technologies. Last but certainly not least is Dr. Renji Chan. She's a research scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Her work focuses on characterizing indoor air quality and its implications to human exposures in residential and commercial buildings. She recently completed a research project studying indoor air quality and ventilation in California classrooms, working in collaboration with UC Davis Western Cooling Efficiency Center. Dr. Chan is leading the Efficient and Healthy Schools campaign sponsored by the Department of Energy. So today, let's start with part one, the basics. So Christian, why do we ventilate and what contaminates indoor air? Hey Todd, hello everyone. Nice to see you all today. Um, great place to start. I'm happy to help kick things off here. So the first question, why do we ventilate buildings? Really two reasons we ventilate buildings. The first reason uh, is to bring in outside air to maintain building pressure. So in any building, uh, we have fans, we have exhaust in our, in our bathrooms, we have exhaust in our kitchens, we have general exhaust, and we need to make sure that the air that's being pushed outside the building as exhaust is replaced with indoor air to maintain building pressure. That's one reason we, we ventilate buildings, we bring in outside air. The other reason, the reason that's really the focus for, of our discussion today is we ventilate buildings, we bring in outside air in order to maintain acceptable indoor air quality or good indoor air quality. And that is we bring in outside air to dilute indoor generated contaminants from people, from the buildings themselves in order to make sure that we're maintaining good indoor air quality. So 
Should I keep going, Todd, right through the questions? Or Well, I wanted to see if uh, Tracy or Ranchi had any thoughts about what constitutes good indoor air quality? Who gets to make this decision? Tracy, maybe you're laughing. Maybe you could uh, speak to that or Renji if you're interested. Oh, Tracy looks like he might be on mute. Of course. So I was laughing because I know that Renji has some has some thoughts on this. I'm going to let her go first and I'm going to back clean up. Okay. Sure. Christian, I, 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 thanks Thanks for those two points. I, I, think I agree completely. I think um, a lot of times people think that I'll bring in a lot of outside air with moisture problem, but we generate people, generate a lot of moisture too. So it's for, for that reason, it's important to ventilate. Yeah, so maybe let me, let me take a stab at, the, at these two and then Tracy and, and Renji, you can jump in um, as well. But in terms of what, what contaminates indoor air, Renji just mentioned moisture. Um, the, we, I think we can think about the contaminants in buildings in three categories. We can think of them in terms of gases, uh, in terms of particles and in terms of microscopic organisms. And just to run through them briefly, gaseous pollutants are gonna be things like you know, organics, like formaldehyde, like VOCs. You also have inorganics, things like ozone and carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide as well. So those are examples of gases. They come from the buildings, they come from um, you know, roads, outside buildings, from airports, uh, these sort of things. Particles, the one we're most concerned about is gonna be PM 2.5, which is this microscopic, mic, you know, very small particle um, that when inhaled is, is unhealthy. And this again, this comes from wildfires. Most, you know, we've seen this a lot recently and there are other uh, uh, sources of, of PM 2.5 or, or particles that we need to be concerned about. Um, and finally, microscopic organisms, those are things like viruses and some bacteria. And obviously this has been very much in the news as well. And these are all, again, different types of indoor contaminants, contaminants in indoor air that uh, oftentimes are controlled with ventilation. And again, you know, again, why we ventilate. Um, and again, just to, you know, these are coming from outdoors sometimes, come in with the outdoor air. They come from the buildings themselves. They come from the people, as Renji just said. And they come from equipment in the building, copy machines and, and other things that we use in our buildings. And, and I like that. And, and I'll add to that, like, there's chemistry happening indoors too. Yeah. When we bring outside air indoor, when we do things indoor, combustions or different chemicals can emit it. So the chemistry that contaminate indoors too. So it's not just the outdoor emitted, indoor emitted, the things that are happening in, indoors that um, pollutes our indoor air. And no. I'll just, just, just kind of quickly, I just want to, you know, when you were asking about, you know, what constitutes good indoor air, and we're going to talk a little bit about this more later as well. But I think one of the things to keep in mind is that, you know, the built environment is built for people, right? So if you want to have excellent indoor air quality, just take all the people out of your buildings, right? Okay. Because how we define good indoor air quality is in relation to how it impacts the occupants. And so I think one of the important things for us to think about is that, you know, we think about indoor air quality um, and managing indoor air quality often from the, you know, sort of the engineering side of it and the chemistry side of it, which is all true and real. But there's also very much a public health side of it too and an individual occupant health side to be looking at. So when you're determining whether or not you have good indoor air quality, it's more than just, you know, kind of what you're measuring and monitoring and what that's telling you. It is the impact that it is having on the occupant and occupant health as well. So thank I you. like that Tracy. point, Tracy. Yeah. Sorry, well, I know first slide is supposed to be quick, but okay. um, yeah. a lot of times we think of indoor air quality as the good indoor air quality is the low pollutant level. We want it to be everything to be low, but we actually think of it more holistically. I think if it's, you know, absence of any contaminant, but the air feels stuffy to you. There's no good movement and air quality and thermal comfort are coupled together. People can't really tell the difference, you know, through survey. So all those things are related. And even then there's absence of chemical pollutants. If it's smell, then we don't think that's good in our quality. And allergens is another like big, broad um, category that we think it needs more paying attention when you think about indoor air quality and that not just the absence of pollutants that we can measure. Exactly. So Renji, that's great feedback. And it's a great segue to part two, our next slide. So Comfort might be part of your answer here, but how do we know if ventilation systems are working correctly? 
Yeah, in your introduction, you mentioned that a recent study that we did, um, we um, did a survey monitoring in 100 schools, 100 classrooms, and we found that people are not very good at telling if they're getting outside air. We surveyed the teachers and people can tell the supply air getting provided in the classroom, but outside air is really hard to know. So I think in order for to answer that question, how do we know really relying on good uh, operation maintenance practices? Um, now, CO2 monitor is one way that we can try to get at a proxy of if there's adequate ventilation. I know we'll, we'll talk more about CO2 monitor um, later, so I'm going to put that one aside. So, But I, I think like it's really important to have really good uh, operation and, and maintenance practices. And I know that Tracy's, your Tools for School, has excellent resources. So yeah. um, for the team or for the group here, so what standards are uh, support ventilation and what are they based on? Where, where do these rules of thumb or standards come from? And follow up to that is, is dilution ventilation really the only way to maintain good indoor air quality? So I'll answer the standards question. I know Christian wants to talk about the dilution. Um, so uh, a lot of us has heard of ASHRAE, 62.1 is the minimum standard. Now it's a standard, uh, your local jurisdiction may or may not adopt it. So in California, we follow the code it's called Title 24, but there is a consideration of how much ventilation we need to ventilate a bioeffluent. So there's like a per person requirement. And there's also on a per floor area requirement, uh, Christian mentioned that you know, your building material can emit pollutants. So those two are both captured in it. And um, as we hear today for chips, I know that different lead standard, different leads voluntary um, higher performance building standard um, tends to push for more ventilation and better filtration. So those are two good areas to focus on that kind of going beyond the minimum and do a little bit more. Great, maybe thank you. Just to build on that, if I can, Todd, and, and sure. get to your third question here too. Uh, Renji just mentioned the importance of, of good, proper ventilation rates. This is the amount of outside air we're bringing into buildings, but also filtration. And that sort of gets at the third uh, point here. One of the things that I think COVID has highlighted as people have pushed for higher ventilation rates is that bringing more outside air can also be expensive from an energy standpoint, because we have to condition this outside air. And when you have wildfires going on outside as well, it can be a bit challenging. So. The other, way, the other ways to address, to ensure good indoor air quality beyond ventilation or often in addition to ventilation is really how it should be thought of, are gonna be, as Renji just said, high efficiency filters. And these might be what are often referred to as sort of MERV efficiency rating, you, you know, following the MERV scheme, the higher the number, the better. Even HEPA is sort of the, the very best, but there are also other air cleaning technologies that can, can address um, gaseous contaminants as well as the particle contaminants. And we'll hear a little more about some of these other technologies a little bit later on. And the only thing that I would add there is, you know, so we have uh, one uh, one professional that we work with, and he always says, you know, dilution is is the solution to pollution, right? And so dilution and ventilation definitely are, you know, what you're focusing on once you know, you know once contaminants are in the space, right? The other part of that though is, and we talk about this a lot in our in our guidance. Um, is you know, two things, source control and smart material selection, right? Because everything impacts indoor air quality. Practically everything you bring into the building has the potential to impact your indoor air quality. So one of the things we wanna look at is limiting or eliminating pollutants at the source, you know, walk off mats and things like that, you know, radon testing and elimination. So you want to eliminate the problem before it starts, right? And then you really wanna give a lot of thought to um, and this, this again, looks at you know, how, we, how we do this holistically. So you want to give a lot of thought to, to the materials that you're bringing into the school as well. And that's everything from flooring and furnishings to, you know, to, um, the, to just every, uh, to equipment in how you're maintaining that. So in addition to providing the ventilation and the, you know, and good ventilation and dilution, giving your systems a fighting chance by, you know, being very cognizant of what you're bringing into the building itself. Great. Thanks, Tracy. I think that's a, uh, we might keep it with you for part three here, which we'll be moving to the children factor. So what's different about good IAQ in schools occupied by children compared to buildings occupied by adults? So two things there, right? Okay. Um, one being the building and one being the kids, right? So schools aren't like other 
building types, you know, there are all kinds of challenges that are kind of unique and specific to school facilities. And, you know, often we know they're older. Um, they're often suffering from severe deferred maintenance. We've got the, got the data on that, right? There's overcrowding in classrooms. We have spaces that are used in ways for which they were not designed. You know, you look around and you see classrooms that are created out of all kinds of stuff and people in offices that were actually, you know, maintenance closets. And so you see, and, you know, so for everything, and there are also activities going on in schools that are that impact into our quality so you know everything from you know food service to vocational activities the way you're cleaning you know your cleaning practices your your pest management so you have all of this you know this conglomeration of things that are going on in schools that can impact uh indoor air quality and again that that work together also to to make it challenging but in addition to that the thing to remember you know, we have adults and kids in schools, and the adults often are going to be in that school a lot longer than even the most challenged child, right? But with kids, the thing to remember is they're not just little scaled down adults. Children function differently than grownups do, and they can often be much more susceptible and more vulnerable to indoor air quality pollutants. They breathe faster and deeper. So, you know, the likelihood of, you know, small particulate matter going deeper into the lungs are just, they're more susceptible accessible. The other thing is they are, they have behaviors. All of us who have kids know this. Kids, you know, one of my friends calls them belly botanists, right? They're, on, they, they're low to the ground. Um, and they're often sitting on, you know, on the floor in school. So things that are being entrained back up into the air, they're closer to, they have hand to mouth behaviors. You know, they touch things and then they touch their faces and their eyes and their mouths. You know, I was uh, a colleague was just relating a story to me. He was there working on an HVAC system in a school and he witnessed a young kid pull down their mask and lick the plexiglass barrier between <laughs> them and the next. Two. They're just curious, right? They're curious. And so you have behaviors that you have to look out for. So it makes schools um, a unique place when we're, when we're looking at indoor air quality. Um, and, you know, I'll I'll go ahead and segue into the next question, if that's, if that's okay, because, you know, that's one of the reasons why it really is important for us to address indoor air quality from a full school community perspective. Um, and that's one of the things that we really emphasize with our guidance is that, you know, the first thing that we ask people to do is put together a multidisciplinary team that includes, you know, not just your facilities folks, but, you know, facilities and construction and teachers and school nurses and parents and bring everyone together and get everyone at the table so that they're, you know, collectively constructing the way that you're going to address indoor air quality in, in schools and not missing any of the any of the important factors. And we have the transparent communication because that's the way that you build trust and agency with people. So you can't just have your facility staff doing things without people understanding and recognizing that they are actually responding to, you know, to important issues that are going on in the school. And then the final thing there is really around um, training um, and education of, uh, of, of occupants. And so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and see if there's anything else anyone wants to say because before we dive into this next one, because, you know, I, I have a soapbox for this next question. <laughs> I'll say um, I've done uh, sampling in schools and offices. And if I would say what's how indoor air quality is different in the school than office, mm -hmm. I'm going to take this questions a little differently. Um, school bring in, even before the pandemic, bring in a lot more outside air than offices. So we do see um, somewhat higher ozone levels. So that also will lead into your uh, chemistry that we need to worry about. Um, and schools start pretty early and uh, they bring in a lot of outside air. So if your community use a lot of wood smoke in the winter time, we see that signal right in. Um, anything that's outdoor, bus idling, vehicle, parents dropping kids off, we see all those signals very clearly. What, and then kudos to Tracy point that like, you know, pay attention to your green material. Some of the more traditional VOC they worry about, you know, formaldehyde, that's come a lot down by quite a bit because now we have the emission set standard. So like the, the, the mix of chemical has changed quite a bit and compared to like a school and also like an office. So those are the like signature that we see different when we look at um, 
school indoor quality. If you go to high school, we see, we see a lot of those body spray, like personal products um, showing up in elementary school, not so much. Um, but there's a lot going on in the classroom. You, you have your class pets, there's refrigerator, there's microwave. So there's just really a lot going on inside a classroom than what an office um, tends to look like. So thank you, Renji. Um, so Tracy, going back to the, the third question here, you know, the impact of high levels of CO2 and high PM 2.5 on cognition and health, it's su such a huge impact how do we how do we address this in terms of social equity factor and environmental justice? Yeah, so you know, I think that you bring up such a, a great point there. And so here's here's what we know. We know that our society is just fraught with all kinds of structural challenges to really achieving equity um, and environmental justice in our schools. And there are these vast disparities, right? And so and inequities in our school facilities. And so, you know, and those costs that are associated with neglect in our school facilities impacts those buildings and those occupants and the school conditions in the built environment are really, you, you talked about, we, we, we talk about, you know, CO2 levels or different things, but these are really, you know, the school, these are social determinants of health for, the, for our students, right? And because our schools are social institutions, they're, they both contribute to and are impacted by social determinants of health. And IAQ, as you referred to there, has a huge impact on health and academic performance. And we're getting, you know, we have increasing data to, to reflect the importance of the built environment on students' ability to be healthy and to, and to achieve academically. And so some of the most vulnerable kids that we have are in schools that are underfunded and understaffed and in the most challenging neighborhoods. And so when we look at something like asthma, it's a classic example of where we are really failing to provide the social and health equity in this country as it impacts our students' ability to learn and ultimately succeed. So having good, a good indoor air program in schools helps control things like asthma triggers, um, CO2, and to protect kids in that way. And the disparities that we see in something like asthma outcomes are, you know, in black and brown children is directly related to the disparities that we see in facilities and IAQ management, right, in schools. And so what I've discovered in doing this work is that one, our language is insufficient for describing this shameful fact. And when you, and the fact is that how you look and where you live and how much money you make determines your health and academic outcomes. And so instead of, you know, instead we say social determinants of health and, you know, we use disparities to describe what is really a national disgrace that our poor black children attending poorly maintained schools are more likely, are more likely to die from a manageable disease that we know how to manage and we know how to manage for in schools. And so this is, isn't that's, you know, that's a little bit of an outrage. And so we know what to do and we can, and we can make the difference in how we address indoor air quality. I think right now we're very fortunate in that because of the pandemic, we have more people, more federal agencies coming together and funneling resources specifically for facility improvements across the country. And so I, I, I see hope. So Tracy, honestly, this could be its own webinar in its own right. So thank you for summarizing that as concisely as you did, but really there's more we could talk about that, but definitely thank you. Um, so we're now gonna segue on to part four, um, the different school scenarios. So Christian, um, I'm gonna hand this one over to you. What have we learned from the COVID pandemic uh, about schools that have a great HVAC system, a moderate HVAC system, or maybe even no HVAC system, and what can they do based off uh, what they're, the, the hand they're dealt with, what type of system they have. Yeah, so this is, this is a uh, topical, obviously still a very topical uh, subject, and we've tried to break it down into three buckets. I think I'll start, though, by saying that every building you know, is unique. It has its own story in terms of how long it's been around, how it's been maintained, the systems that are in the building. So it's hard to, to prescribe a silver bullet for our schools in, our, in terms of our response to COVID. That said, I think we can break it down to these three scenarios just to give some, some overarching comments. And I'll start with that and then let Tracy and, and Renji jump in here as well. 
But as you said, the first scenario here that we'll describe is a, a, as a perhaps a more modern school that has an up-to-date HVAC system and has MERV 13 or maybe even higher than MERV 13 filters. And we're using MERV 13 here because this is what the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force has recommended as the minimum, if, if possible. Um, in fact, what they say is you should have at least MERV 13 or the equivalent. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, perhaps. Um, and if you can't get to MERV 13 as much as you can. So given ASHRAE's recommendation is MERV 13 or higher uh, with at least the minimum outside air, perhaps more. Uh, if you have a modern HVAC system with those filters, the key, and actually the key for all of these, for whatever system you have, is that it's properly maintained. Unfortunately, we're behind on maintenance with many of these systems. There's a deficit there uh, in terms of our maintenance activities. We have to make sure that the systems are working properly. The dampers aren't stuck. The filters have been replaced. They're being you know, replaced on a regular schedule. That is what is most important. If your system is operating the way it was designed to operate, it's a, it's a modern system with MERV 13 filters, then you should have the, the appropriate air changes uh, and the appropriate particle filtration that the epidemic task will recommend. And you're pretty good, pretty good shape, generally speaking. So that's the first scenario, a, a school with a, a modern HVAC system and MERV 13 or higher filters. The key is making sure everything's working properly, the way it was designed to work, and you're replacing the filters on a regular basis. The second case is I think where many schools fall, and these might be a little older school or at least having an older HVAC system, perhaps it has MERV 8 filters, a lower efficient particle filter, and, and maybe can't be upgraded to MERV 13 because you don't get, there's too much static pressure, you don't have enough fan power to push air through a, a denser, a more dense filter. So in this case, you know, the, the language from ASHRAE is MERV 13 or equivalent. The way you get to the equivalent here or to compensate for the MERV 8 versus MERV 13 difference is to either increase outside air a little more to get more dilution, more air changes from outside air, assuming you can do that based on what's happening in the outside air. Um, but at the same time, the other thing that you should be considering in this case is local HEPA filtration high efficiency filters that can be deployed in classrooms, either on the floor or perhaps from the ceiling or, or mounted on the wall. But adding some local filtration will boost those air changes, that the amount of time the air is being cleaned in the space. And that can get you to your MERV 13 or equivalent. So in the second case, it's you got to compensate for the deficient MERV efficiency by either bringing in some more outside air or by boosting those air changes with the local filtration solution like a HEPA, HEPA system. In the third case, this is perhaps the most challenging. This might be an older school. This is the type of school my children go to. It's an old school that doesn't have a, an HVAC system, doesn't even have unitary systems in the classrooms. So here, you, you really have to deploy local air cleaning. You don't have a mechanical way to move air through the building to achieve air changes with outside air. So you need to be deploying local air cleaning. And oftentimes, that means local portable HEPA filters, portable HEPA filters, or, or maybe ceiling mounted. Uh, HEPA filters in the classroom. So that's how I would approach it. I'd love to hear if Tracy or Renji have anything to add. And for the last case, eventually we would like to bring some ventilation to these classrooms. So for longer term and for COVID, yeah, I, I agree, you know, filter, filtration really works. I think for longer terms, we'll need to think about what's our game plan in five, 10 years from now. Um, they are retrofit solutions for um, classroom. I, I'm from the Bay Area in California temperature pretty moderate. So an ERV, fitted ERV would serve that purpose. Um, it's a few thousand dollars kind of solution, but it brings in outside air. You know, our, our uh, winter are not too cold, summer not too hot, so maybe it's an easy one. Um, in other climate zone, we kind of need to think about harder, how to bring in ventilation in the long run. Yeah, yeah, I think Renji's absolutely right. You know, um, one of our key drivers in our framework for effective IAQ is around planning, and we look at both short-term and long-term planning. And I think especially now with the with the way that people are responding to the pandemic, the time is coming for us to really, or it's always been there really, for us to start to pivot from addressing the immediate needs of the pandemic. And as we're putting things in place for a pandemic response, thinking about the long-term impacts that they can have. And I think it's, you know, it's often hard for schools when they're in a crisis to think long-term, but that is really the time when you need to be thinking long-term and not just responding to the problem that's in front of you, because there will be another, you know, viral infection. There will be another IAQ crisis. And so how do you take this, you know, how do you take whatever, um, 
action or intervention you're doing to respond immediately and make sure you're building in long-term impl uh, uh, implications and outcomes into that intervention. Great. Thanks, Tracy. Thank Ren Thanks, Renji. All right, so we're going to move on to part five, which is other contexts. So Renji, we're going to start with you. Here's a question we often get. Does opening a window do any good? When the outside is nice and the air quality is good, I'm all for it. Like do outside outdoor classroom, right? It's just so, such a big part of our country and heating, a lot of heating require, a lot of cooling require uh, outdoor allergens. If you're not opening a window, you're letting all of that in. Um, poor out, uh, air quality days. Um, so I, I think on days that are good, with open windows are great. It's just limited and we cannot always rely on opening window to help us when we need it. All right, well, thank you, Renji. So Tracy, next question is gonna be for you. What proven and emerging alternatives are there and what are the applicable standards? Great. So, um, so, so again, I think, you know, kind of returning to, you know, the, the, the state where we are right now with the pandemic, you know, one of the things that the pandemic has done is, is like I said, it really has helped the, fam the federal family kind of get our act together when it comes to providing support to schools and coordinating around that. And so we've really been focusing on, you know, providing the most effective strategies on IAQ for schools that they can start to take action on right away. And the thing is, you know, there's, it, it, this is a difficult time for folks and there's no magic product. There are no shortcuts, right? Um, and so this is a, really a time for doubling down on what we know are the evidence-based technologies and practices. So CDC, the CDC guidance that you see out there was done in consultation with EPA. Um, and it recommends really, you know, what we see is the big three, and we've talked about them all through here, you know, uh, increased outdoor ventilation, enhanced filtration, and when necessary, supplementing with portable air cleaners. So when we're then considering emerging or alternative technologies, we really encourage schools to do their due diligence. First of all, do those for those three things first, because in, uh, in so many cases, schools have not been doing those three things. They haven't been optimizing ventilation, filtration, and, and supplemental air cleaning to begin with. So do those first and then see whether or not you really need anything additional. And if you're going to be looking at some of these emerging technologies that are out there, some things to be considering, you know, really, you know, looking for third party verification of those things, requiring that vendors are providing you um, data that the, the um, on the efficacy of these interventions and not lab data, data that is done in real settings like schools, right? So people really have to do their homework uh, around this. And this is just, this is not the time to lose your IAQ religion. You know, this is the time to really, you know, go back to the basics and, and work and work the plan all the way through. If that's, you know, that's the thing that is going to be, be a best in the end. And just, and, it, and, and especially when you're looking and choosing different things, making sure that you're careful about products that have the potential to generate you know, ozone um, or other factors into the air that can be harmful um, or create harmful byproducts for the indoor air quality. So that's, you know, that's, that's, my, that's my story on proven and emerging technologies. So, and I'm stuck with well that. done on a very tricky question. So uh, <laughs> that I'll, was I'll say one, one quick thing is, as we look at school, school has a lot of different spaces. There's classroom, there's offices, there's your music room, sports. If you're really thinking about, oh boy, that's like a space I could use an uh, emerging technology, Think about space as you think is the most risky and maybe talk to your school nurse or your school community, like pick a space. You may not need to like do this technology for all your spaces, identify locations. And maybe you're like, I have an old gym. I cannot put in enough ventilation or filtration is really challenging. Maybe, you know, be more thoughtful about it. Like how are you applying this technology and what space is it suitable for? Absolutely. Thank you, Renji. That's, uh, well, I'd also recommend uh, searching on Google and doing some research. Um, so Christian, over to you. So what should uh, school decision makers consider and what questions should they be asking vendors? Since you're kind of a vendor, this might be appropriate for you. What are your sure. thoughts? Sure, so I'm gonna try to build on what Tracy and Renji were just saying. I'm gonna offer two suggestions here. One is to think not just short-term, think longer term. And the second is to think about um, the interventions in terms of the energy costs and how they'll affect your budget over the long term as well. But in terms of the solutions and short term versus long term, I think one thing that Tracy was alluding to is that during COVID, we've seen a lot of people looking for a silver bullet. 
And there's been a lot of marketing and a lot of you know promotion of, of new ways to deal with this challenge. And I think also a lot of short-term thinking, people looking for the Band-Aid that they can put on to sort of make this magically go away. Um, and so I th as we think about the life of these buildings and the prospect of not just flu seasons, which are seasonal, but possibility of, of pandemics in the future, we should be thinking about future proofing and making investments that are going to benefit, benefit us over the long term. One example um, that, that I'll offer to, to think about, which is something that, that Inver has been working on, is you know, portable filters are great. But um, an alternative is to spend a little more money, potentially some of the COVID relief money, and, and fix something, mount something in the ceiling. The benefits are going to be that's out of the way. So it's going to be a better longer term, long term solution. It's going to be quieter, less disruptive from a noise standpoint, so less likely to be turned off. So this is an example, one example, where there's a bit of a trade off. Quick and easy is buy it on Amazon, not literally, but you can buy these relatively easily, take them out of a box, plug them in, you're done. They're cost effective. Or spend a little more money and install something in the classroom that might be more durable, that might be a longer term solution that you could envision using in two or three years. Uh, rather than having to dig those old portables that are in the closet somewhere and figure out where they are and if they still work and, and where you're going to put them on the floor. So that's one example. Think long term because um, there is money to be spent. Uh, there is support out there. Let's use it for investments that will benefit, benefit us over the long term. But think about the energy too, right? These different solutions have different impacts on your energy costs and that's your operating costs. You're creating a, you know, certain solutions will create a long-term liability and we all know how tight the budgets are. So we'll talk a little more about the energy trade-off, I think, here in a moment, but that's something to consider as well as you're looking longer term. Thank you, Christian. So, um, you know, I've been reading um, on the internet about some low-cost do-it-yourself options. And one is, you know, take a box fan and duct tape a MERV-13 filter in front of it. So, Renji, what are your thoughts on measuring IAQ? Why is it important? Uh, you know, are there any good low-cost do-it-yourself options? And which metrics should we be looking at? We'll start with Renji and then uh, Tracy, you can fill in. Sure. So I, I think you mentioned the box fan, right? It's quite popular. Um, it, it's great to engage kids. I mean, sometimes when I work on this project, I get reminded, I think Tracy is great. I like The more we can engage the education part of it and not just the facility manager making facility improvement, the better. So I'm, I'm more for the box fan. Um, what should we measure? Um, depending what, what question you, you're asking, if the facility manager is wondering, well, do, we, do our classroom have vent good enough ventilation, adequate ventilation, then we'll go with CO2 monitoring. And if you're thinking about CO2 monitoring, I would suggest doing more continuous long-term monitoring versus the one-time handheld. Um, that's because CO2 concentration changes very rapidly throughout the course of a day. It's hard to get a good sense of what ventilation is if you just get a one-time measurement. If you're in a wildfire-prone part of the country, then definitely when you think about IAQ monitoring, don't forget your particle, um, particulate matter PM um, monitors, because you got to be asking questions about, what, should I close my window? Should I tell my teacher to close them? I know that I told them to open them during COVID, but now it's wildfire season. Without indoor PM, it's hard to make that decision. So the more information you have about how your indoor qual air quality is during those days, the better. So if you're in those areas, I would recommend think about CO2 and PM. And then a lot of um, IAQ monitors will, uh, will include other gas monitor um, sensor. So NO2 will be one, also might be another one. So ask yourself how, if you're deciding whether to buy that extra sensor, what, what are you going to do with the data? Are you going to look at the data and decide, am I activating or deactivating my air economizer? Can you use your data that way or some other way? So have a plan for what you're going to use the data for before you purchase those extra parameters. So Tracy, it looks like you're nodding. Would you like to add anything to that? No, just Randy hit it right on the head. You know, um, people, you know, we, we, we love data. We are data-driven animals, right? Um, and, and so the temptation is often there to monitor and measure because we can, right? But I think Renji hit on the most important thing when she said, when she was talking about, you know, like measuring for, for you know, for, for PM during a wildfire event to decide whether or not you're going to open the, open the windows. Make sure that what you are measuring and monitoring is connected to your actual indoor air quality goals and outcomes. And so you, so you which means 
you have to have some before you start measuring and monitoring things, right? And so is it the, what's, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna, Christian's going to talk next year about, you know, kind of what, you know, what's important and, and why, um, but, you know, it's what's important to measure is based on what is important to you to have happen or what is important to inform your decisions about what you want to do. And so, yeah, so there's, you know, um, a variety of measuring and monitoring techniques you can use, but they're all tied to what you want your actions and your outcomes to be. Christian, any thoughts on the metrics and uh, what do they need to know, the school personnel? No, I think that I think it's been covered. CO2 is often used as a proxy for your ventilation rate. You know, it's also influenced very much by how full the classroom is. So you have to, you know, understand that and, and weigh that. And then um, PM 2.5, I think is the other key one. Somebody in the chat, I think mentioned humidity as well. Um, there is a connection between humidity and COVID. You want it ideally between 40 to 60%. That's the best region. If you're higher or lower, it actually is. Uh, it's been shown through research to um, prolong the life of, of a bioaerosol, for example. So controlling humidity is also important. So I know Renji talked about uh, or answered a question about opening a window, and I brought up the fan with the filter in front of the box fan. Does anybody else have any? Before we go on to the next slide, any other low-cost or no-cost do-it-yourself options? Any favorites? <laughs> Well, I just want to say, you know, for measuring and monitoring, you know, I think, you know, when we talk about sort of that hierarchy of, of activity and we talk about engineering, you know, uh, controls and administrative controls. And so a lot of the technology is on the engineering side, but there's a lot to be done on the administrative side, too. So checklists and tracking sheets mm -hmm. and having, you know. Um, checking in with your occupant feedback, your facilities folks being really front and center and, and continuously monitoring and observing what's going on. On that administrative side, you know, the, the, the tool is only as good as the hand that you're putting it in and how well they are um, they're maintaining and, and monitoring and measuring. And again, you know, our guidance, ASHRAE guidance for schools, there's all kinds of places you can find checklists, monitoring sheets. You don't have to make it from scratch, but make sure that people are actually are, are tracking no matter where they are in terms of resources or what have you, there's always something you can do. Tracy, great point. Um, all right, so I think we're gonna move on to part seven, which is energy decarbonization in the future. So Christian, I'm gonna tee the first one up for you. How does the ventilation system impact energy use and does it always increase energy use? Yeah, so one of the things that we've heard a lot from schools and other building owners and operators around COVID is, uh, with the initial guidance to maximize outside air, bring in as much as you can and reduce recirculated air, right? What a lot of people, especially in hot and humid or cold climates found is that that resulted in a large increase in their energy bill, their utility bill. And this is of course, because all this outside air that we're bringing into the buildings and those climate zones in particular needs to be conditioned. It needs to be dehumidified, cooled or heated to maintain comfort. So there is a correlation and for a long time, you know, we've always we've thought about better indoor air quality comes from bringing in more outside air. But I think one of the insights from COVID is, you know, as it's reminded us that this can be very expensive. The other insight is that we need to make sure we have the right levels of filtration and other air cleaning solutions, which oftentimes can be as or more cost effective and are always, I would say, more energy efficient. So one suggestion here is we think about increasing ventilation rates and how that impacts our energy costs and our energy efficiency goals is to think about, are we doing as much as we can from an air cleaning, from a filtration standpoint, from a air cleaning standpoint, um, and to the extent we can improve or increase that air cleaning capability or filtration capability, we can probably deliver the same or better indoor air quality and do it somewhat more efficiently than just relying on outside air. And this, of course, varies very much by climate. Right? If you're fortunate to be in a temperate climate where the outside air is always fresh, then bringing in that outside air is going to be the more, most cost effective. But unfortunately for many of us, we don't live in those climate zones and, and, and we you know, have schools near highways and airports and the outside air isn't always fresh. So that's where the air cleaning comes in. And I think we'll often find that that's going to be a, a more efficient uh, way to deliver good indoor air quality. Thank you, Christian. So uh, Renji, next question is going to be for you. How can school operators make their systems more efficient? Um, I mean, if you're thinking about retrofit options, if you are installing new system, definitely look at features that can save the ventilation energy. These are air economizer, demand control ventilation. I know the set point needs to be adjusted right now, but um, still it's getting, getting control over when you ventilate, it's important. 
um, then you look at your ERV, your HRV, um, and then the list go on. So there are, I think, on the technology side that we can make ven ventilation energy, decrease our ventilation energy use, and not just by brute force of not ventilating as much. And, and things that we talk about, you know, operation maintenance being so important. And one point I want to push back is, I know we hear school say that, oh, my older system can't handle um, a MERV 13 air filters. Um, pay attention to bypass. Maybe you cannot increase the MERV rating, but you can do, still do better with filtration if you in, uh, uh, do something with your upgrade, your filter rack, so that it fits better, there's less leakage around it. So there are ways to do better with filtration, not just like it's a MERV 13 or not decision. So I think those are some of the things that school can pay attention to. Thank you. Um, Tracy, do you have anything to add well, to that? Well, I was just going to say the other thing oh, yeah. that I was interested to, to okay. learn recently is that not all MERV 13, MERV 13 filters are the same in terms of pressure drop. Um, it turns out that they're, they're not always the same. So it might also be good to look carefully at, at what the, the uh, pressure drop is for the manufacturer. And maybe there are some options that can, can get you where you need to be without that same impact. Right. It, it, just more media, it seems like more pleats will probably drop the, reduce the pressure drop. Um, okay, so the next question is, what should school decision makers consider when planning a new system? So Christian or Renji or Tracy, anyone want to take a shot at that one? When we're pl when planning for a new system. Um, yep. Well, I, I, think it's, I think here you want to be thinking about what are the indoor air quality goals and, and what are the um, factors that are going to impact your ability to achieve those goals? So again, what are the outdoor air conditions? Where is your school located? We've been recently, um, I'm, I work out of the Boston area, and uh, the most uh, polluted school in Boston is, is in Chinatown, right near I-90 and, and 93, at the intersection of these two highways. So as I'm thinking about you know, designing a, a ventilation system or putting in a new system in that school, uh, I might think about that differently than I do for a school in Massachusetts that out that's in the Berkshires, for example. So I think that's a key consideration. Is what are the goals and what are the challenges that you'll be dealing with to achieve those goals? And then think about, okay, how can I do that uh, most cost effectively and also energy efficiently? So not just the first cost, but the, what's the life cycle cost look like? Um, and, and this is where you need to engage your designers and your engineers to think through these different options and whether you want to incorporate something like an energy recovery system, which we've seen some, you know, some chats about, um, perhaps something uh, we've developed called sorbent ventilation technology, which can, again, help you clean that indoor air so you may not need as much outside air. Uh, these are different ways you can maybe solve that. But think about your environment, what your goals are. Are you going for a lead or well or chips? You know, what are their requirements or recommendations as it relates to indoor air quality? Um, what do you need to control for? And then what's the most cost effective, but also really long term, most cost effective approach to do that? Great. Yeah. yeah we Decarbonization is a big theme now. So um, I, is your school ready to try newer technology like air source heat pump, geothermal? Are you ready to try uh, DOE system plus VRF, the so variable uh, return flow technology? So like kind of detach the heating cooling from ventilation so you get better control both ways. So, so there's some new technologies out there. I think it's still newer to schools, definitely a learning curve. I know that staffs are behind on training already. And so like how do we get all, not just the equipment but also the training, the knowledge so that school can manage the system. But there, there are, I think, a lot of newer technologies out there that school can think about. And I think it's really important, like you're saying, Renji, to get schools educated about some of these newer technologies. It's like, you know, Christian was saying, you know, for, for so long, we've had this, you know, this idea in our mind that, that, you know, there's this Faustian choice between good indoor air quality or energy efficiency savings, and it's not, you know, they are inextricable inextricably bound to one another and it really is the balance of the two and with existing and some of the newer technologies coming out um it really it, it doesn't have to be a trade-off it shouldn't be viewed as a trade-off they really do impact one another we have another piece of guidance our, our um energy savings plus health guidance that um that helps schools when they're looking at retrofits of especially for their um for their hvac systems and for their energy management to really also incorporate 
the the aspect of you know providing the healthiest environment for you know for students and staff as well and we and we in this case we can't have it all thank you tracy so um i think here as we're last question for our, our panel what do you see as the future for ventilation so why don't we each get a shot at this and um we'll try and wrap it up afterwards so renji maybe you can start us off what do you see i i would hope contractor cares more about the goods that they're delivering. We see, um, you know, facility men trying really hard, this community is all, all interested. How do we get the people actually implementing, putting this equipment and making sure it works, not just going through the motion, really think that ventilation is important and making sure that it works. That was a uh, great answer. I didn't expect that one. Uh, Tracy, how about you next? Man, so, um, you know, so for years, my, you know, all of my colleagues and people who work with me know that, you know, I've been, you know, beating the drum that schools should be, you know, pristine palaces of learning, right? That there's magic happens in these spaces. It should be done in temples and palaces. And so, you know, I think that one of the, one of the most positive learning experiences that we've had from the pandemic is people are talking about indoor air quality. You know, they, they are invested in indoor air quality as a component of their, of the importance of what's going on in their schools and not just in their schools, but in all of their buildings and their lives. And so, you know, I see a lot more ownership in the future of personal ownership of people about indoor air quality that is going to, and I think that that is, that's going to be the tide that lifts all boats is that we have a smarter client, we have a smarter consumer, we have a smarter, you know, just citizenry, and that that toothpaste is not going back in the tube, right? I think that it, it, that we are going to have to really, um, really address that. And, and, it, and it's exciting, because I think that the demand, you know, we've been we've been putting the supply out there, but I think that the demand side is really coming up. And that's exciting to see. So Tracy, that's a, I, I totally agree with you. I, I know when my neighbor about six months ago asked me about MERV 13 filtration, I knew the world had changed. Exactly. So I, don't, yeah. I mean, you totally were spot on, I think, there. So, Christian, how about you? What are your thoughts for the future of ventilation? Yeah, who would have thought two years ago that IAQ would be front page news in the New York Times, right? And right. that's what's changed. So, I, in terms of the future, I think we're going to see more MERV 13 filters, as you just said, Todd. I think the standard is eight right now in some applications. I think it's going to become 13. I think we're going to see more IAQ monitoring, more people wanting to actually see the data and understand what's happening in their kids' classrooms and there's more accountability around that. The, the analogy there is, you know, I don't know if it was 20 years ago exactly when it was, but talking to some real estate owners, they used to view putting cameras on their loading dock as a, as a liability. They'd all of a sudden, have, you know, catch somebody doing something wrong and it caused problems. But at some point they realized it's a liability not to have the camera there. We've had the same thing now with IAQ. People didn't want to monitor it because it would create a liability, it created something else they had to respond, another hot cold call, but it would be an IAQ call. They didn't want that. But now they're realizing if I don't have it, I'm going to be on the hook because people are going to start complaining. They're going to bring their own monitor. It's going to be in their watch or on their smartphone pretty soon. So it's a liability not to have it. So I think that's going to be a big change. But to, to back to Renji's point, we have to figure out how to do all this and do it energy efficiently. Tracy brought this up as well because you know low EUI designs, low energy use intensity, this carbon climate, this carbon crisis is not going away. So it's how do we... Uh, increase our standards for indoor air quality and the way we monitor and measure them, but do it in a way that's energy efficient. That's the future and that's the challenge before us all now. Thank you very much. I think our next slide, we're gonna go to audience questions. We have a few minutes here and I'm gonna read through the chat here. Um, I think I read one about uh, from Claire that says, what does it cost to install a new ventilation system, not full HVAC, where no system exists? So. Do we have a feel for that? And she said, uh, New York State data suggests that half of all public schools in New York State, dating from the 1800s to today, have no mechanical air handling system. So do we have a feel for what would it take to install a new ventilation system, say, per classroom? Renji, you threw out a number, I think, a little bit earlier, if I, don't, if I remember correctly. So I actually don't have a good answer to this. Do, do, can, can you got to be in a, if, if it's not a... a Full HVAC system, we're talking about forty, fifty thousand dollars per, you know, unit. Um, I uh, uh, just through the wall system, if you can make that happen, a few thousand dollars to maybe ten thousand dollars a unit, kind of depending on the existing structure, like what you can, what it looks like. So I think those are rough guesses. So Renji, I totally agree. I think those are great ballpark answers. There, um, those would have been what I would have said too. 
Um, another question, how can parents support monitoring if they're not in the buildings? So, you know, how do we, how do we get the parents to see, make the invisible visible so they can hold the school accountable for the results they want for their kids? So how can we do this? So, you know, I think part of it is, you know, going back to what I was saying about how we recommend that you put the indoor quality tools for schools program in place. And it starts with a multidisciplinary team. And so, um, so parents, if, if parents feel like they don't have access into that school, then they really should be lobbying and advocating to be in conversation with the, you know, with the organizers and with the powers to be there, you know, to, to kind of get there. I think the other thing is that one of the things that parents can also be monitoring and reporting back is what is happening with their kids and with their kids' peers, right? And so, you know, you you are the expert on your child as well, right? And so, and I think to different uh, different people listen with different ears. And so, you know, I think that for, you know, parents, it should be encouraged to be having those sit downs with the school health official, whether that's the school nurse, or whoever that is, with the school principal and sharing what is important to them about, you know, about indoor air quality and the impact that it's having on that child. So they can start to, you know, so they can start to kind of get in there and, and, and let them know that, you know, we're not, I'm not asking for monitoring, like we were saying, for it to be a gotcha, right? I'm asking for monitoring so that we can create a better indoor environment for my kid and for all the kids and for all the staff who are going to be here for 20 years, right? So, um, so parents, you know, advocating to get at that table. So let me just read a couple of comments that are all kind of the same, and maybe I can get your, your thoughts on this. So uh, Daniel says, uh, you know, hey, he's a contractor, uh, valid points, but, you know, engaged owners can certainly help uh, contractor performance, right? And uh, Daryl pointed out that always going with the lowest bidder, that could be part of the problem from your contractors. And uh, Dr. Irella said, uh, yes, agreed. So any thoughts on how do you, I mean, how do we get the, the total cost, right? Total value of the installation taken into account instead of just the bid, right? The lowest bid, possibly the shoddiest work. Any thoughts there? Well, I think that's where when you're doing a project, thinking about the life cycle cost comes back into play, mm -hmm. right? So maybe you can cut some corners and save some money up front, but if it's going to drive up maintenance costs or long-term, you know, operating costs from an energy standpoint, for example, um, it just gets back to that longer term thinking, I, I believe. And um, I mean, there are mechanisms in school, I know school sometimes have bad experience with energy performance contract uh, as a finance mechanism, but that's one way to hold them accountable. If they did a crappy job, they're not going to get those energy savings. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think too, what we've been talking about in terms of um, really having your school staff as educated as they can be. And like Christian was talking about setting those goals before you start engaging with contractors, right? And so, you know, so, you know, I was, you know, it kind of hurt my heart when I saw that, you know, one of the, kind of, one of the comments was saying that, you know, this contractor was feeling a little bullied by this conversation because we know that there are things for which it is just better, more effective, um, and more successful to have it contracted out because, to, you know, the school staff just does not have the bandwidth to be able to do it. And so I think on the contractor side too, educating your client, your schools about what to expect um, and how to maintain and really, you know, not going in expecting that they that they know everything that they should know about selecting and and supervising a contractor in the best way. So it's a, it really is, I think, a two-way street. Thanks, everybody. I just want to share a couple of thoughts from the, the, the chat room here. So pre-qualifying contractors, they thought that was a good idea. Commissioning a system after installation to prove it's doing what you said it was going to do. And uh, having defined HVAC system performance goals is another great one. So thanks, everybody, for that feedback. So I think we're probably close to finishing up here. It's 159. Yes, uh, thank time. you everyone. And this was fantastic. Todd, thank you so much. Excellent job moderating. Thank you to Renji and Tracy and Christian and to everyone who joined us today and to Arnell for opening it. Really appreciate you being here. And, and this was fantastic. I'm, my brain is full and I'm bubbling with excitement. So I will post the recording and the slides next week for everyone. And if anyone has questions after the fact, no problem. Just go ahead and email us staff at chips.net. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.